First, let me introduce our company briefly. DNP Hypertech is located in Kyoto, Japan. We develop and provide application protection products. Our products are based on tamper-resistant technology to prevent malicious analysis and tampering. We've been involved with the Japanese gaming industry for more than 10 years. So now let's take a look at the history of the Japanese gaming industry a little here. Many of us remember Space Invader released in 1978. This was the beginning of the Japanese gaming age. After that, games such as Pac-Man and Super Mario, Pokemon, and Dragon Quest, and Final Fantasy were released. And in recent years, games that play on various platforms such as Splatoon and famous titles for mobile like Super Mario Land were born. I guess you guys know some of these games. And this is the data on the current Japanese game market. The market size is about 12.4 billion and it's ranked third globally. As you can see, the Japanese, market, Japanese game market is huge on a global level. And behind this, protecting games from malicious activities is taken seriously, especially in PC and mobile games. We offer protection for both. I know in Europe, the popularity of console games is very high, and PC and mobile games trail behind a bit. But however, uh, as Lucas of Unity Technology said in the opening keynote on the first day, uh, did you see that keynote? Not, not much? Oh, perfect. <laughs> Unity enables you to create a cross-platform game easily, and so a flexible development such as from console to mobile or from PC to mobile will become more popular in future. So I assure you that our knowledge about anti-cheat and anti-hack anti will be as helpful for you here in Europe as it's in Japan. And I'd like to share about the range of threats and the protection of mobile phones, which is the biggest platform in Japan, and in particular Android games. Here is the outline of my presentation. First, security threats to mobile game apps. Second, a case study. Then, lastly, let me introduce our protection products, Crackproof. OK, let's get right in the main subject. First, what are some security threats to mobile games? Here is the ecosystem of mobile game distribution. For example, there is a danger of stealing or tampering data between the client and the server by packet interception or using a proxy. And recently, ad fraud has been proliferating in online marketplaces like Google Play and Apple Store. Also, on the client side, which I'm focusing on today, there are the risks of code tampering, reverse engineering, and memory alteration. These are the top 10 mobile risks of 2016 and published by the Open Web Application Security Project. As you can see, code tampering and reverse engineering are included as threats to client. Of course, these threats are really relevant to mobile games because they can lead to attacks like the following. Manipulation of scores and hit points, unlocking of the locked, locked stage and scenarios, in a purchase fraud, gameplay automation, and so on. And these may seriously affect your game business. Risk one, breakdown of game balance. By leaving the uh, unauthorized play uncontrolled, the gaming experience of the authorized user will be compromised, and you could lose the players. Risk two, loss of inner purchase opportunity. You may miss the opportunities to earn money due to stolen inner purchases and game piracy. Risk three, flood of negative reviews. 
Brand infringement makes it difficult to acquire new players. So that's why protecting your games is essential in building a sustainable game business. Now I'd like to show a demo video of memory alteration so that you can see that cheating is actually carried out casually in many cases. We've made a simple competitive fighting game where players attack by tapping. In terms of the game, game structure, first, these are jewels, which are in our purchase items. Players can exchange 50 jewels for one item that increases their attack power. Then they can increase their attack power tenfold by using that item. There are a few potential points that could be altered, but in this demo, I will show you what cheaters will do if they want to somehow win when faced off against a character who is extremely strong, like you see here. So if you can increase the number of these jewels, you can use them to increase attack power and healing items. So I'd like to perform an alteration to increase these jewels without paying money. Please take a look at the video. Okay. So the demo app is on the left and the cheating tool is on the, on the right. I won't reveal the name, but I'm using a major tool for memory alteration. So for comparison, first I tried playing normally. The first turn has ended and it seems like I lose on the next turn. So I've exchanged all of the jewels I have and raised my attack power. And if I try to use additional jewels, I have to pay a charge, so I select no. And raise my attack power and attack. Yeah, but I lose after all. So next, I'd like to use the cheating tool and perform a memory alteration. Once again, I start the screen from the beginning. And launch the cheating tool. And then return to the game. Then open the tool. And it shows a list of apps that can be attached. So I select the game I'm, that I'm currently playing and search for the value. The search result is displayed, as you can see. There are still too many results, so I can't tell which location is the jewel value. This means that I need to narrow down the results. In order to narrow them down here, I'd like to change the jewel value, so I try using some jewels once. The jewel value has changed from 100 to 50, so I tried looking for this value. So the, the results have been now down more than they were before, but there are still a lot of results. So I try using jewels once more. Oh, sorry. So there are still too many results. So I'm using the jewels once more. And I go back to the cheating tool and search for zero. Now only a few results are left, so I try testing out the results starting from the top. If I select this and change it to 999, as you can see, the number of jewels has changed to 999. Now all I have to do is use this and obtain a huge number of items and raise my attack power and then I won with a single blow so as you've just seen players can easily cheat with a cheating tool even if they have almost no programming knowledge the sum of such casual activities for individual users may cause serious risk for the company. 
Okay, now I'll move on to a case study, the spread of tampered APKs. In this part, I'd like to introduce a damage case that actually took place, as well as the measures that can be taken against it. In the case of game publisher company A, after the company released an app, they made an inquiry stating, our app has been damaged and we'd like to address this right away. And we asked about what had happened in details and we learned that APK that were tampered in order to increase players' in-game attack power were spreading and it was causing a loss of revenue. So why? Why were the tampered APKs created? In short, the causes were DLL file analysis and alteration and memory analysis and alteration. I'd like to, use, I'd like to look at the individual components. First, with regard to the analysis and alteration of DLL files. In the case of an Android app, being built with Unity, there are two options. One can use IL2CPP or one can use MonoVM. This slide shows a simple flow diagram for when building using MonoVM. I think using C Sharp is popular and when you build the code written in C Sharp, it is contained in the APK file as a DLL, which is an intermediate language. Then, when the app is actually launched, libmono SO, which is called by libunity SO, loads the DLL, and the IL intermediate language is compiled into machine language by JIT, just in time compilation and executed. This aspect of the DLL being an intermediate language is not ideal from a security standpoint. Various meta information which can be interacted with is contained in this, so the source code can be easily be decompiled. For this reason, if no measures are taken, this is the same as the source code being exposed. So you may wonder, how exposed is it? It's this exposed. On the left is the original source code, and on the right is an item in which it was built once, and then the DLL file was decompiled using a decompiler called ILSpy. If you vi visually compare the left and right sides, you'll notice that the using statements are visible. Then as well, the structure of the functions and even the symbol names has been reconstructed. I think you can see that the left and right sides is essentially the same. The source code being visible is the same as the game's logic being visible. So from here, it's easy to discern which code to change in order to cheat. Then how can we counter this risk? Effective measures include obfuscating or encrypting the source code or using hash algorithms such as SAJ1 or SAJ256 to check the hash value. In addition, while this isn't a direct measure, you can also take the approach to output as a native file from the beginning instead of using DLL. If you use IL2CPP, a native SO file is generated. This cannot be reverted to C sharp code at the, at the assembler level, so I think it makes sense to consider this as a way of making it more difficult to be analyzed using a decompiler. Uh, in the case of company A, you may assume that they hadn't taken such measures at all. Actually, this is not the case. They had a dedicated anti-cheating team internally and were engaged in the obfuscation of source code. So then why did tampered APKs emerge despite that? Another conceivable cause is the analysis and alteration of memory. If one wishes to view the memory, 
it's necessary to attach using a debugger. As for methods commonly used by malicious users, one is targeting the linked portions between modules. The interface for modules and frameworks includes calling in conventions and the method of calling a set. For this reason, you face the difficulty that the type of processing is apparent and you can obfuscate that portion. So it's possible for malicious users to use such linked portions as entry ways to analyze the overall logic. And using a debugger makes it possible to view each action of an app by placing breakpoints or stepwise execution. This means that, for instance, it's possible to grasp what kind of method or function is being called during a player's attack turn. As a measure to combat malicious users, for instance, there are properties and functions that can be used to determine whether a debugger is attached. One example is a property called isAttached, which is in the debugger class of the .NET, .NET framework. This is a method to detect by periodically calling such properties and functions. However, this isn't a flawless measure either. One potential drawback is that this method is pointless if the code to detect the debugger is altered. So measures to prevent code, code alteration must be taken as well. Another weak point is that the de developers themselves will become unable to perform debugging on the app they have created. This may sound obvious when you hear it, but it's important to keep this in mind as it's actually something that tends to be overlooked. So to summarize, as I have explained today, in the case of company A, obfuscation, encryption, and hash value checking are effective methods of DLL file analysis and alteration. Also, debugger detection is an effective method for the analysis of code in the memory. However, each of these methods has weak points as well, so it is necessary to keep in mind that by no means is any single measure flawless. And I'll touch on other representative methods for anti-cheating measures that are performed on the client side. In addition to the method of debugger detection, in order to prevent the alteration of values in the memory, programming tricks can be used in certain cases like I showed in the demo earlier in this presentation. The operations using rooted or jailbroken devices or emulators are not cheats in themselves, but they could be a step, a step toward cheating because they make cheating methods possible or easier. So it's important to detect and guard against such operations. So these points are vital for client-side anti-cheating measures. So please consider them carefully and think up a multifaceted approach approach to measure these problems. OK, with that, lastly, I'd like to briefly introduce the anti-tamper security product, Crackproof. Crackproof is anti-tamper application protection software to protect apps against malicious activity. It is used for anti-cheating measures, piracy prevention, and algorithms protection. An essential functional characteristic of Crackproof is that it blocks both static and dynamic attacks. A static attack refers to an attack at the file level, like DLL alteration that I told you about today. And dynamic attack is an attack at runtime by using debuggers. It's very important to protect apps against both type of attacks. 
And these are the concrete functions, anti-debugging, memory access detection, anti-disassembly, anti-repackaging, and so on. And when it comes to protecting apps, what is also indispensable is that it should have less impact on the development process. I know no one wants to take too much time and effort for security. Crackproof is used for apps after debugging, so you don't have to modify the source code for security. Besides, the ease of use is also important. To implement security with Crackproof, first you choose security options. For example, if you allow users on a rooted device, you can turn the root detection off. Next, you upload the target file to the cloud server, and then hardening the security process is completed in the cloud. After that, you download the app and confirm the operation and release it. So it's very simple and easy to use. Next, supported platforms. This is one of the reasons I'm giving this talk today here at Unite. We've offered protection for native apps such as SO file in case of Android. But along with the spread of Unity and in response to the desire to protect apps made with Unity from many game companies, we began offering protection that can be protect DLL files built on Unity last year. And I can't give the details for all platforms today, but we offer protection not only for Android, but also for Windows and some other platforms. As for Crackproof's track record, from its release to the present, it has protected over 424 game titles in total. Among our clients, there are some companies that have been using Crackpro for over 10 years. You can download case study papers on our website. So that's all for the introduction of Crackproof. In addition to Crackproof, our group also offers security solutions, app security testing that automatically checks improper behavior in modules for apps in development, in a protection that protects released apps. We are offering information on all, all, all of these at exhibition booths, so, and, I, and we have also prepared demos of actual operation. And also, uh, I don't have QA time in this session, unfortunately. So please come to our booth. And our booth is here. So thank you for listening. <laughs>